So I'm glad you're here for week number two of Almost Honest Christians, a series about the blessing on the other side of awkward but honest conversations. So a few months ago, I had a chance to reach out to the pastors on our staff and the Christian school teachers on our staff and all the members of our staff with this question. If you had to give yourself a letter grade when it comes to confrontation, when it comes to saying something when something needs to be said, but saying it in a Christian way, a loving way, a Jesus way, if you had to grade yourself on that, what grade do you think you'd get? And I was curious when these people who were far from being brand new in their Christian faith, people who in many of their cases had read the Bible from cover to cover, had been following Jesus not for months or years, many of them decades, what they would say. And here's what they said. C+. plus. One member of our staff said, explaining how her heart just wasn't wired for confrontation. She loves it when people get along and she just cringes when there's tension in the room. C plus was her grade, which was better than D plus. I run from confrontation. This person left the caps lock on when they typed the word run. Uh, D plus, another guy agreed. He said he was pretty good at speaking the truth, but I think he said, I speak it from my soapbox, from a super judgmental position. I think the best grade I saw was a B. An experienced Christian woman who said, with more practice and a few tools, it does get easier. And I've also found that when confrontation is done well, the end result is peace and improved relationships for everyone involved. The pastors of our church, the teachers of our school, the Christian staff members, the average grade did not make them the valedictorians of Confrontation University. Uh, They missed the honor roll. And they knew it. How about you? If you had to grade yourself on having hard conversations with people that you care about, speaking up when you need to speak up, but speaking it in a Jesus, uniquely Christian way that's humble and approachable and gentle and kind and full of compassion, if you had to grade yourself on that, what grade do you think you'd get? I'm not sure when I say the phrase, confronting someone who needs to be confronted if a certain situation pops into your head. Uh, Maybe that person in your family who's just so short-fused, blows up about every little thing. Traffic starts a fight. Politicians start a fight. Every little thing just blows up. It's just a pattern of behavior. He's not apologizing for it. He's not owning it. If there's someone like that in your life, have you said something? Or your granddaughter, who was raised in the church, who was raised with Jesus, who still says that she's a follower of Jesus, and you you see her social media, and it just makes you wonder, if she loves Jesus, why does she keep liking the things that Jesus does not like, and that he definitely does not love? If you have someone like that in your family, have you said something? There's one of your buddies who's just not, not nice to his wife, and just the tone that he uses, the way he speaks about her when she's not around or sometimes to her when she is around. It's just nothing like the way Jesus speaks to his church. If you have a, a friend like that or, or she thinks she doesn't need to show respect to her husband because he's not the greatest guy in the world, have you, have you said something? If there's someone that you love that's had one drink too many, way too many times, just a pattern of an unhealthy, sinful relationship with alcohol. Have, have you said something? If your son or your brother or your best friend who says he, he or she is all about Jesus, but now they've moved in with their significant other and they almost think like marriage is just a piece of paper instead of an institution that God invented, that it's their body and their sexuality, that all these rules are just a mom and dad thing instead of a father, son, and Holy Spirit thing. Have you said something? If you have a cousin who speaks about different ethnic groups in a way that breaks the heart of the God who loves the world, a God whose very heaven is filled with people from all nations and tribes, have have you said something? If your pastor is not much like Jesus, 
if you sense something in me that is far from the biblical standards of how a man of God should lead the church of God, have you said something? For someone you know, just their, their default setting is to criticize and complain and nothing's ever good enough and this perfectionistic spirit just like drags down everyone in the room. Everyone sins, right? But when you see patterns of sinful behavior that people don't seem to either see in themselves or care about in themselves, my question for you is, have you said something? I have a hunch that you're a lot like us. An almost honest Christian. Not a pathological liar, but someone who doesn't tell the whole truth when it gets uncomfortable. If you're taking notes at home or here live, I'd love for you to grab a pen and write this down. I have a hunch that for lots of us, there is a sinner that you are not confronting. It's like last week, we said there's probably a sin so scary to speak out loud, you're not confessing. I bet there's a sinner and you're so scared of that conversation that you're not confronting. Here's maybe a shortcut to know if that's you. If there's someone in your life or at our church or in your family or at your work that you talk about but you haven't talked to, if there's someone, I can't believe they did it again and you're your girlfriend knows all about it and your best friend knows all about it and your husband has heard all about it a hundred times. You've spoken about that person but never actually spoken to that person. Well, you are an almost honest Christian. If everyone in the room knows about him or her and what they do but the person themselves would be shocked that everyone in the room knows or has been talking, uh, you are an almost honest Christian. And you don't have to explain to me why. People are people. There are no guarantees that when you point out someone's flaws or what they need to change, they're going to love you for it. Jesus did that with the Pharisees. Do you know what they did? They murdered him. The prophet Jeremiah did that with the Old Testament people of Israel. Do you know what they did? They threw him in a well to starve him. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament did that with an ancient king of Judah. Do you know what he did? He sawed his body into two pieces. John the Baptist confronted an ancient king of his day that he could not commit an adulterous relationship. Do you know how the king thanked him for his kindness? Chopped up his head. (laughs) So if if you're scared to have a hard conversation, I, I think you have some valid reasons why. Sometimes people lash out. Sometimes they turn the tables on you. Sometimes they burn bridges and run in the other direction. Not everyone thanks you for loving them enough to speak the truth. And I think that's why a lot of us don't. Instead, we talk about that person. Maybe we even pray about that person. We hope that someone, somehow, in some miraculous way, the light bulb will go on, they'll change their behavior, they'll see the destructive path they're on away from Jesus. We hope, but we don't speak. And I think you know, like I do, that's not good. I think you realize, if you give it five seconds of thought, that unconfronted sins are a lot like cancer. They don't get better by themselves. No one wants to go through the chemo of really hard conversations, but if we don't, that little bit of sin starts to spread and hurt a lot of people. Your sister, your best friend, you can tell she's drifting from Jesus his word, his people, his book, his values. This conversation will be hard, but if you don't have it, it won't get better, it will get worse. Some of you have had terrible experiences in the church because the the pastor was a bully or the pastor was abusive or there were red flags about the pastor's relationship with the church offerings, but no one wanted to confront the pastor. And so what happened? Did it get better? No, more people got hurt It got much worse. And so we hate confrontational conversations. We just want everything to be happy and fun. But if we don't have those conversations, real people that God really loves gets really hurt. That's why today, even though this is going to be a heavy message, I'm glad that you're here. 
Uh, I hope that today God nudges you, more likely shoves you into a really vital conversation that we all need to have. So today I want to give you a biblical crash course on how to confront people the way that Jesus would confront people. I want to try to teach you what the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles and Jesus Christ himself embraced. And to do that, I'm going to cover three things. I'm not going to have enough time to do it, but I'll give you my best crack. I want to talk about who should be the one to confront. Hint, not everyone. Whom are the people that we should confront? Hint, not everyone. And finally, how should you confront people? Hint, very carefully. All right, biblical confrontation, who, whom, and how? Aren't you glad you came to church today? All right, question number one. Who should confront? Uh, according to Jesus, in maybe one of the most misunderstood sections of his entire teaching, his answer to that question was this, repentant Christians. Some people make the mistake of thinking what Tupac Shakur thought. I, I was in high school in the 90s as a hip-hop fan, so I, you tell me a Tupac song in the lobby, I could probably rap it to you, but I won't. <laughs> uh, Tupac, what he had a, I'm trying to remember where the tattoo was. Was it here or on his back that said, only God can judge? Which kind of makes sense, right? Only God's perfect. Only God knows the whole story. Only God should judge. I mean, who are you? And who am I with all of our flaws and all of our failures to look at another human being and criticize their flaws and failures? That's why a lot of people, maybe the only Bible passage they know is when Jesus said, do not judge, Matthew chapter 7. But that's not exactly what Jesus said. Let me show you the context of Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says some people should not judge, but there are other people who absolutely should. So Matthew 7, starting with verse 3, Jesus taught this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Verse 4, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to take the thing out of your eye, if you're not willing to address the sin that's happening in your heart, then absolutely you are not the right person to judge. If there's some double standard where, you know, this book applies to you, but not to me, it's really wrong if you do it, but it's kind of understandable if I do it, then Jesus says, uh-uh, uh, hypocrite. That's a double standard. People are going to laugh at the Bible if that's how you teach it. Don't judge if that's you, right? This is like the couple who's fighting and he's like, you're just trying to get what you want while he's trying to get what he wants. It's when the dad who says, everyone stop yelling! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first, first you and then them. Did you catch Jesus' language there in verse 5? He says, first take the plank out of your eye, which means first deal with your own sin, and then Leave it to God? Mm -hmm. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Does God want you to care about the speck, the sin, in someone else's life? Jesus' answer is yes. Yes, you should. Does God want you to speak up about that thing, to be part of the process of removing it, to lead them to repentance? Yes. If you're not willing to deal with your own sin, then don't say a word. But if you take this book seriously, then you absolutely have the right. Which is logical. I mean, if you think only God can judge, only God can say anything about anyone's behavior, just think that out for a second. Parents, if you're raising like two sons, one son, bam, smacks the other one in the face. If you said, well, who am I to say something? I mean, I'm not a perfect man. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you're the police officer, someone's like smoking meth behind the wheel while texting on two separate phones, you say, hey, I have issues too. <laughs> but no, we, we, we know right? some behavior has to be addressed even by imperfect people. And Jesus taught that spiritually too. If you take your sin seriously, then you can take their sin seriously too. 
If you have repented for your wrongs, then you have every right to grab the same book that brought you to repentance and apply it to them. It's actually really helpful. Um, let's say you have a hard conversation and someone throws it back in your face. Oh, like you should talk. Oh, like you're so perfect. Here's the perfect answer. Uh, you're right. I'm not perfect, but I am repentant. And you? You're absolutely right. I, I did the exact same thing that you're doing. But by the grace of God, do you know what I did next? I repented. Will you? You're right. This sin is part of my story too, but I'm, I'm trying with God's help to never do it again. And you? You and I have imitated, copied each other's sins. Now, will you copy my repentance? Who has the right to confront everyone in this room who takes this book seriously and repents of their sin? Which brings us to question number two. Whom? Whom should you confront? Well, the fact is, people sin every day. Right? If you had to literally confront everyone who wasn't prioritizing God in their schedule, their life, in their budget, if you had to confront everyone who used the name God or Jesus or Christ in an unbiblical way, if you had to confront everyone you know who is out of the habit of going to church or who dishonors the governing authorities, who doesn't embrace the Bible's sexual ethic or isn't content with the money that God has given them, who laughs at things they shouldn't laugh at and gossips behind people's backs and isn't content that God has blessed them with salvation and Jesus. If you had to confront everyone in that situation, you would need to clone yourself first, quit your job, and never sleep. And maybe that's why the Bible says that isn't your job. Now, who should you, whom should you confront? Pick on the answer to that question. According to the scriptures, you should confront Christians who don't seem repentant. Both those parts are really important. God does not call you to confront non-Christians for not behaving like Christians. Of course. Your job is to confront people who claim to be followers of Jesus, who claim to love the God of the Bible, and yet, as best as you can tell, they don't seem to repent of the things that they do. I'm not talking about a non-Christian, nor am I talking about a Christian who messes up and apologizes, who sins and owns it. Obviously, God's doing a work in their heart. The people you should be most concerned about are those who claim to follow Jesus, and yet you look at their life and it seems like they have no desire to follow Jesus. They confess, I'm a Christian, and yet, when you look at their life, they don't seem to love the things that Jesus Christ loved. Those are the people you should confront. Jesus himself said it, Matthew chapter 18. This is a long, great section on biblical confrontation. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. There it is, huh? You go, don't leave it to God. And if who sins? Your brother or your sister. It's not your biological family. He's talking about your brother or sister in the family of God. Someone calls God their father, but is living in rebellion to the father's rules. Your job is to go and point out their sin. Jesus, did you catch it? He said the same thing in Matthew chapter 7. He said, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Right? There are times when we have to speak out about the injustice in this world or confront someone who's hurting another person, no matter what they believe about Jesus. But in general, the biblical teaching is that the world's going to do what the world's going to do, but Christians should focus their attention inward. Do you think American Christians need to hear this right now? I do. Can you believe the Grammys? Well, what the world is embracing, these are the end times. Just non-Christians being non-Christians. Why would someone follow the Bible if they don't believe the Bible? Can you believe he talks like that? I'd appreciate it if you didn't use the name of my Savior. Like, well, if, you don't, if you don't believe Jesus is your Savior, why would you love his name? Right? Our, our concern is not with non-Christians acting like they actually are. Instead, our concern is for a brother or sister who doesn't seem 
to be all that concerned. Now, there's a little bit of an art and not a science to this. Uh, You might notice I had you write down Christians who don't seem repentant. Uh, Your problem is you don't have a pair of Jesus glasses that let you see into someone's heart. Are they sorry or not? (laughs) So maybe here's a a bit of advice. Not in the Bible. I made it up. So if you don't like it, that's fine. (laughs) Here's my advice. Three strikes and then you're called out. Right, if I see you doing something, if you see me doing something, let's, let's say the way I talk about my wife, Kim, just doesn't, it's not loving or good. And you notice, but you give me a little bit of time. You don't like put me on blast. Give me some time to say, hey, you know what I said wasn't cool. But I, I don't say that. Strike one. Then sometime later, you notice me doing the same thing. Like, ooh, is this a pattern of behavior for him? You give me a little bit of space to own it, to apologize, to repent, but I don't. Strike two. If the third time comes, you've probably seen someone who doesn't see the seriousness of their own sin. Three strikes, and it's time to get called out. It's time to approach them with plenty of evidence now and say, hey, I remember when you said, and then you said it again, and then you said it again, and I, I can't see your heart, but it doesn't seem like that's a big deal to you, is it? If they repent, you get to give them forgiveness in Jesus. And if they don't, you get to take their sin as seriously as they should. So, what have we learned so far? Who should confront people, repentant Christians? Whom should repentant Christians confront? They should confront those who don't seem repentant. Which brings us to question number three. I want to do those first two Kind of quickly, because this really is your question, isn't it? How do you do it? Okay, Jesus, yep, yep, yep. I, I see what you're saying. It is my job. And I can think of someone who says they're Christian, but they're just not following the path of Jesus. But how do I do this? I know family from our church that said, Pastor, how do we, how do we confront this member of our family and still see our grandkids at the end of the day? We've been friends for a long time. Man, if I say something, is the friendship going to be? How do I do this in a way that the relationship is going to make it and hopefully be stronger after the conversation is over? Well, can I be more than almost honest with you? That's not your business. Someone's reaction to the truth is not your business. If you're only going to say the right thing if people respond in the right way, I honestly don't know how you can follow Jesus. If you know the Bible, do you think Jesus got up to preach and looked around at the people and say, now Jesus, just remember, they have to like you. He spoke what was from God. He spoke what was true and like him or hate him, applaud him or put him on a cross. He would speak what was in their spiritual best interest. And that's so important for you. Some of you live in the fear of people's reactions. And that is the idol of people pleasing. You've taken a good thing like your friendship or your relationship with that person and you've made it like the ultimate thing, the God thing that you can't lose And that's a bad thing. There are times people will hate it. They're living in the dark and you're going to turn on the lights. They're going to try to push you out of the room. That's still the privilege you have to try to save their soul. If you went to your doctor and she she said, well, I'm not going to tell her this. She's not going to like it. The screen says it's cancer, but you're doing great. (laughs) No, we know that it is in a person's best interest to hear the truth. And so their reaction, if they want to be hard-hearted and stiff-necked and stubborn, if they want to double down on their hatred for the ways of God, that's not your business. That's their business. I I pray they react with humility and grace and respond to the truth of God. If they don't, that's on them. It's not on you. Don't let the blood be on your hands by biting your lip and not saying what you need to say. Speak the truth. Speaking of love. 
Here's the best way to do that. I call it the golden rule of confrontation. Write that down. That's super helpful for me. The golden rule of confrontation is how you confront a fellow Christian. Jesus said in Matthew 7, um, what is this, five or six verses after what we just read about judgment? He said, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. In everything. So if the tables were turned, if you had some spiritual blind spot, if you were committing a sin habitually, how would you want someone to confront you? That'd be a good bit of homework. If you know you need to confront a friend or a family member, just make a list of things. Well, what things would I want someone to do? And what things would make it really hard to hear them if they did this to me? If I found out they had talked to everyone else in the family before talking to me, that would make it hard. If you had to get advice from everyone because you didn't have the courage to say it to my face, you trashed my reputation, didn't even give me the chance to repent, that would make it very hard. If you picked the wrong time and place and I was embarrassed in public and couldn't process, that would make it hard. But if, like Jesus said, you pointed out my sin just between the two of us, and you had enough love not to talk about it with other people, but you brought it to me first to give me the chance to change, that would make it easier. If you came with the truth and not just your own opinion, but there was an open Bible on the table, and you could read the passage and say, here's why I'm concerned for you. It's not my religion. It's not my church. Like This is what Jesus said, and I saw you do this once and then twice and then again, and I'm worried for you. And you know what would help, I think, more than anything in the golden rule? Is love. And I'm super concerned for our culture because we've come to this spot where we think if if we're speaking what's right, that's all that matters. If I'm right politically, if I'm right about a social justice issue, if I'm right about doctrine and the Bible, it doesn't matter how I say it. I'm going to drop a bomb on you and then it's on you. No, no, no. The Bible says if you don't have love, if your heart isn't broken for the sin of another person, it's why I'm so grateful for Pastor Glenn. So after 16 years of being a pastor, I'm still pretty rough around the edges uh, with hard conversations. I was really rough when it was year one of my ministry. I was like, chapter, verse, you're wrong. Stop it. See you next Sunday. <laughs> you get the slightly better version of me. But God in his mercy, uh, he sent me to a church in 2007 where Glenn was the pastor. And Glenn taught me a lot of things in those early years. But one thing that just has stuck with me for over a decade was his phrase, drip love. He told me that as Christians and as pastors, we would have to have a lot of hard conversations with people Sometimes they would avoid us because they wanted to avoid God's truth. But when those conversations came, Glenn said, do everything you can to drip love. To have your love for that person be so evident that they can, they can see it with the tears in your eyes, when your voice cracks, when you're not just there to do what Jesus says to do, but you're so literally concerned for their faith, their future, their eternity. He said, drip love. If there was a witness who could witness that confrontation. May that witness be able to testify, look how much he loves her. He's trying so hard, doing everything he can to win her over. Drip love. Friends, there's going to be a time when you have to come with an open Bible, When you have to send the email, if they don't want to meet with you face-to-face, we're going to have to copy and paste the passage. When truth is going to have to be front and center, I'm I'm concerned for you and here's why. But when you do, drip love. Don't balance truth and love. People need to hear so much love to be able to swallow the truth. A call to repentance is like a bitter powder. Stick it in the, the smooth pill of love and compassion for that person. Do everything you can before, during, and after the conversation to let them know, I love you. 
I love God. I love you. I was scared to speak to you. I'm, I'm talking to you because I love you. It would have been easier to just <laughs> turn a blind eye, but I love you. Say it and say it and say it. So when the devil tries to lead them into temptation, that you're some judgmental church person, that can't be true. I love you. And there's so much proof. And I pray that when they hear that truth, when they see that love, they confess. And then you get to say the most beautiful words in the world. You know God loves you, right? Yep, you did it once, you did it twice, you did it three times, you've been doing it for three years. You know Jesus died for you, right? Sometimes you've got to hit people hard with the law, shatter that hard heart, but you get to stitch them up, put them back together with the gospel of God's forgiveness, even for stubborn people, even for proud people, even for totally lost people. You get to remind them that just like you find your hope in the forgiveness of Jesus, they can too. So put all this together and what do you got? Who should confront? Every repentant Christian. Whom should be confronted? People who claim to be Christian but don't seem to be repentant. How do you confront them? You're not led by people pleasing but the golden rule of speaking the truth and speaking in love. And if you ask me one last question, Pastor, why? Why would I do that this week? Uh, my one-word answer would be peace. Either they repent, respond to God's word, oh, and just the peace of knowing that they're good with Jesus, or the peace of mind of knowing that you had the courage to say what needed to be said. That you weren't a Christian coward, that you didn't sweep it under the rug, that instead, just like Jesus did, you spoke the truth and you spoke it in love. That will give you a peace that will help you sleep well at night. So, got someone you need to talk to this week? If like 15 of you email me, I'm going to be concerned. <laughs> but you can if I need it. And sooner or later in life, we all need it. I hope when you do, uh, that the same thing happens to you as happened to Sarah and her sister. In the past year, there was this woman, I'll call her Sarah, who found one of my sermons about the beauty of heaven online, and she emailed me to tell me exactly how much she hated it. Um, I think I was trying to answer the question, is there marriage in heaven? And I opened my Bible to Matthew 22, where Jesus said, no, it's even better than that, because God is there. Well, it turns out Sarah had just lost the love of her life. Her husband had died. She had found that video in the midst of her grief, and she hated it. In fact, in an exchange of emails, she, she told me, if I don't get to be married to him in heaven, I don't think I want to go to heaven. And I knew that she was hurting, and I knew that she was grieving. I knew I needed to be patient and give her some space, but I also knew it's a dangerous thing to think. Like God's not good, and heaven's not good, unless I have this man and I'm married to him. I was trying to figure out if I should say something and how I would say something. How do I follow the golden rule of confrontation? But I didn't have to because Sarah's sister spoke up. Apparently, Sarah's sister was seeing the same thing up close that I was observing from a distance. And she reached out and confronted her own family member. A few days after that conversation, Sarah's name popped up in my email inbox. This is what she said. You probably thought you were finished with me. Don't delete this just yet. My sister just messaged me and asked, are you putting your husband above God? Sarah said, the courage that took. I immediately called my sister back and said, I have. I replaced God with my husband. But now I'm back on track. I joined a grief group and reached out to a friend, and I thanked my sister for her courage. I still have a long road ahead, but there is blessing that I'm awaiting for. I'm on the right path, and Pastor Mike, may God bless you. Sarah. 
Maybe during this whole sermon, you've been thinking about what could go wrong. I want to ask you today, what could go right? Could someone who's been replacing God with their favorite sin, could you be the one to open their eyes and help them see, even if the road is long and the struggle is hard, that they can be on the right track, the track that leads to eternal life in the presence of Jesus? Love it or hate it? Make you squirm, make you smile. Almost honesty is never a Christian's best policy. So may you follow Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. And may his truth bring life to you and those you love. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, help. Uh, we, we get nervous just thinking about it and... Maybe that person's not in the room right now and we don't know where or when or how or what we'd say or what we'd say next. But you're a God who knows the future and you are the God who can do all things. And so we're praying now for courage. Sometimes we need strength to resist our own temptation, God, but there's a different temptation here and we need your strength too. To actually believe that the truth is always best for people. That letting people take a path that gives them short-term pleasure but leads to long-term pain apart from you, that is never good because that is not love. God, help us to to finally speak. And when that moment comes, God, when all those uh, fears and worries and anxieties swell up, help us to sense your spirit who is speaking through us as we open the word of God. Father, we can all can look back on churches, even that turned a blind eye to sin on women and especially men who had positions of leadership and authority who hurt people and hid behind the church. Oh God, that is not what we want for this place. We don't want to be a place with great music and nice coffee, but where people get hurt and no one does a thing. So God, give us courage. If it's me, if it's a pastor, if it's the president of the congregation, if it's the biggest giver and donor, God, let sin be sin and let it be expelled from among us. We want to be a place that is not just full of biblical truth, but a place that is bursting with biblical love. We can't do it without you. But with you, all things are possible. So we pray for your help today as we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.